What up, y'all? Zarek, Underdogs of Addiction here. Um, today's video is about my journey with alcohol and how towards the end of my addiction with alcohol, how it nearly took my life and my trials with sobriety, rehab, and relapse and to let you guys know that this isn't always a linear process. And for me, it's been a very rocky road, um, even through treatment, the struggles I went through in treatment. So I'm gonna start off by saying that I believe the problem use and addictive use of alcohol is only means to try to find um, a way to cope with what we're dealing inside, dealing with inside whether it's anxiety, whether it's depression, ADHD, feelings of emptiness, feelings of loneliness, feelings of inadequacy. I know for me, those were always the reasons I drank. It starts kind of early for me. My earliest memories literally were watching my dad pounding Budweiser's, smoking weed, hiding in the bedroom, um, him showing off his guns or his guns or whatever gun he had, um, him punching holes in the wall, him threatening my mom, cops dragging him out of the house. Uh, just my earliest memories from when I was four years old was, was, was just seeing my father just being a fucking animal. And he was only 24, 25 years old, but or actually, you know, he was 28 at the time when I was from my earliest memories but just a lot of violence and uh, that was my life and I didn't understand it. And I had a lot of post-traumatic stress experiences from those times that stuck with me my whole life. Those, if you know anything about post-traumatic stress, it causes unwarranted anxiety and panic attacks. Um, and when I was younger, I dealt with it in different ways, like escaping through video games and skateboarding all day or playing football or um, whatever I could do to distract myself. But these are the origins of my alcohol problem. Um, then with that came poverty and my mother not being emotionally available because her own trauma and her own stress dealing with my dad and my three other siblings and her trying to navigate how to survive. And so me being a young child, uh, I just always wanted attention. I just don't. Uh, I just always wanted somebody to like appreciate me, you know, because I felt like, I don't know, I just felt like I wasn't very important. I was told that I was ADHD, um, you know, you're too hyper, calm down, you're just like your dad, um, you know, and luckily I had some loving brothers and sisters and, and that really helped me with some of those feelings of loneliness even though we went through a lot of hard times the first 10 years of my life with poverty, and having lights and water shut off and having Salvation Army give us gifts and sponsors and food banks. I mean, I did it all. Um, and all that led to me developing a very low self-esteem because I go, well, you know, I'm not as good as these other kids. And when my parents tell me that I'm bad all the time. And I just remember just this, this dying sense of, needing to feel like I'm important or that I'm good enough and, and that birthed a whole different life for me and it was the origins of all of my addictions when I was 10 years old my mom left my dad and she got a job for the state we bought a house a car and we were middle class uh, my life completely did a 360 um, and I kind of forgot about those old feelings but oh trust me they were still there and um I found that I was very gifted in athletics, skateboarding, football, basketball, baseball, whatever. But my primarily sport that I was the best at was football. And I had a dream to make it to the NFL. And as I became more of a star player in my middle school and high school years, um, by the time I was a senior in high school, it became my addiction. Um, I was obsessed with becoming you know, a Division I football player and an NFL player. Um, I was a kid who would train after practice or go to the gym before and after school, um, stay in the film room every lunch break and try to study and just get in. 
and I was I became addicted to the validation of the fans on the and going under the lights and the validation of the newspaper writing about me and the validation of being popular and everyone at school thinking I was important and my coach treating me special because I'm a star player and I never once drank or did any cocaine or anything like that in high school because my drug of choice was fame on the football field and popularity and I didn't realize that when I was younger and I had no clue that I'd eventually become an alcoholic and um you know, as that dream died out and I didn't get that Division One scholarship to play for UW, I did get a scholarship to play for Central Washington University, but I turned it down um, and I eventually decided to forget about football and focus on my music career because I always was a talented musician and I came from a family of musicians um, and I loved music. But then again, there was still that hole inside of me that wanted to be filled with, um, with fame. Uh, I love making music, don't get it twisted. That was, it was a perfect combination. And in high school, I was selling out shows and um, it was really popular for my music and uh, I touched a lot of people. And so uh, there was, and, and uh, I and eventually became um, a very f popular YouTube independent recording artist with over 60 million views on YouTube. But the origins of that all stemmed from this feeling of inferiority and that I wasn't good enough and I needed an audience's attention. And all throughout high school, I never drank or used drugs. I was addicted to football fans and popularity and then music. And throughout my 20s, my early 20s, were the first times I started having to deal with um, that emptiness because I'm out of high school. The, f the women, the fans, all that stuff's gone. Everyone's left. You're not such of a big shot anymore. You, you gotta fucking get a job and figure your life out. And, I'm at the bottom of the barrel in the music industry. Nobody knows who I am. I'm a MySpace rapper. And those feelings of I'm not good enough, all that came in and bloom. Here comes blooming my addiction. And I became obsessed with the world is gonna know who I am. The world is gonna know who Styles Majors Eric Simmons is because I'm one of the best rappers ever. I became delusional. And though I was a very talented artist and had a lot to speak about, it was coming from a place of of pain and so many artists that make it and are famous come from the same place and um, you know I would sit up all night adding people on my MySpace back in 2008 I would um, you know I had a couple videos go viral on the internet because I used fake titles and pretending that it was somebody else's song who was famous and put my song in the background I did all kinds of shit I was so desperate to become famous um, and then it finally actually happened and in 2014, um, I had multiple songs between, between 2014 and you know the years coming after that that um, did 15 million views apiece. Uh, through my marketing strategies that I developed, I was able to get my music heard on a huge scale. Um, I have multiple songs under the name Styles Major that have millions of views. And I finally did it. I, I wasn't a Post Malone fame level or Tupac, but I was popular people were stopping me in my hometown and my streets and being like yo I saw your video on TV or on a YouTube playlist like I can't believe that's you I told everyone that's Eric and it was like a weird feeling because I finally was getting that notoriety that I always wanted um, people were hitting me up I had the NBA hitting me up wanting to use one of my songs then one of my songs got put on a big huge uh, TV show um, and the song charted top 10 on iTunes briefly um, I was making, I wasn't making millions of dollars, but I was making like a, you know, hot upper middle class money that I've never had. And um, that was actually when I experienced some of the uh, lowest points of my life. And my addiction uh, started to bloom around the age of 26 years old. And this is when my depression and anxiety and addiction all went crazy. During this period of time, I lost my grandmother who I was extremely close with and my uncle Mike also passed away. And, and those are the first times in my life, or, well, not really the first times, but th those were some hard deaths to deal with. And on top of the isolation of me now, not working a normal job and making money, and it kind of ostracized me from my friends because everyone's like, well, Zarek thinks he's better than us. He doesn't have to work. He's making this amount of money every month. And that led to a lot of isolation, which is terrible for someone who struggles with addiction. And, um, you know, I... I just would go to the bars, you know, 
four or five times a week and just go drink beer of uh, you know 12 beers buy food and I thought I was having fun and I didn't realize I was numbing all those feelings because once I had some success guess what I said I'm still not good enough because I'm not as famous as Post Malone or Wiz Khalifa or some or Drake so I'm still a failure even though I'm touching millions of people's lives and um, that was just a wild experience and I had no idea and that just fed my addiction and over the course of 26 till I was 32 my music career slowly died and died and died um, to the point where um, it was dead and my addiction had grew and taken over and I went from making you know hundred thousand dollars a year or a little less than that but like a good amount of money you know to having to resort to selling drugs to be able to pay my rent and bills and I had no music money coming in anymore um, and I was just empty and part of my addiction to alcohol stemmed from me realizing that no amount of fame would ever fulfill me and also knowing that I still wasn't as famous as some of these other artists and that went took me down a really dark path that I decided I, I didn't know how to fix myself and so I would drink I would drink and I would drink and um, I would you know I got introduced to cocaine when I was 28 and that that's when it just got worse and I would stay up I would go to the bars and numb myself and I'd sing karaoke and hang out all these people who I thought were my friends they're all just lost people in their own pain and uh, I would just get drunk and I and I knew I was lying to myself but for those eight hours at the bar because that's how long I'd stay there I felt alive and I felt okay with myself and like God Vermont always says, don't ask the addiction, but ask why, what do we get from this, this substance? And alcohol and coke made me feel okay inside and it calmed my brain. Um, but eventually, you know, it all ends. And after years and years of partying and binging, a lot of bad things happened. DUI, being arrested in another state, missing work, not being able to work because I can't stay sober losing my music career, not training MMA or lifting weights like I used to, um, losing connections with my family because I'm just so out of it mentally that I don't want to go to family functions. Um, and that's when, you know, I started asking questions, you know, what is it inside of me that needs this? What's so broken inside of me? And that was around 28 years old. And from 28 to 32, I've been on a, a journey counseling, going into um, online courses like Gaber Mott's Curiosity into Addiction, Margaret Paul's Inner Bonding, and I started to understand that the root cause of my addiction were, were rooted in childhood. And once I began to start working on what was really bothering me, the journey began, but it still wasn't enough. And when I reached rock bottom almost two years ago, um, I had nothing left and I was suicidal and I didn't know what to do and I reached out being vulnerable, something that a lot of addicts can't do because of the shame and stigma and I told my uncle I needed help and um, long story short he got me into treatment and I, I spent 11 months in multiple treatment centers as well as sober livings and um, I started on the path to healing and recovery. And I have other videos about that. I don't, I don't, I'm not going to get into that. Today's video is just about what alcohol was for me and the origins of why I started drinking. And the, the first time I got drunk uh, was 18 after football season. So I, you know, I realized that my football career wasn't going anywhere. And that's when I decided to start experimenting. And the first time, I know it's cliche, the first time I had that Bud Light at this party with these hot older college girls, uh, I was like, oh, man like I, I took that drink and my brain just was like whew, all the serotonin and the dopamine and I just felt so good um, granted the next morning I felt like shit and then I didn't drink for a long time um, there was throughout my 20s I didn't drink much it, it wasn't until my mid 20s that I really started to to really rely on it and then up until my early 30s and I'm 34 now um, but that's what alcohol was for me you guys it was an escape from pain that I did not know how to deal with, um, mental health issues that I did not know how to deal with. And so I hope this video helps you kind of understand maybe your own addiction to alcohol and, and maybe it can help you start on your journey. And I hope my story maybe inspires you to uh, look inside yourself and see what you need to do to become a better person, 
Um, you know, that's all I really wanted to talk about. And, you know, now that alcohol is out of my life, um, I'm really, you know, starting to be able to sit down and feel everything. And I still, ha I still go through moments um, where I'm 10 out of 10 on wanting to escape. And instead of running to the bottle like I always did, I just sit with myself and ask myself what's really going on. I call a friend, I process whatever's going on, I go for a walk, I do anything but pick up that bottle. And 99 times out of 100 times, I'll, if I go through those steps, I, the desire to drink goes away. And it, it's so hard once you're in the depths of addiction of alcohol to break that habit. But I'm telling you, like as somebody who is as bad as it can get, as far as binge drinking goes, like you don't have to drink. You can you know, prevent relapse, you don't have to relapse. Um, and so that's all I got today. Uh, appreciate you guys, and um, I hope you all have a good one.